Hello, I'm Michael Cantrell, and you are listening to the Prison Officer Podcast, a place to have a conversation about the forgotten cops that work in this country's jails, prisons, and correctional centers. A place for me to try to make sense of a career spent working inside the fence with some of the greatest people that nobody sees or recognizes for the important job they do to keep this world safe. If you love this podcast, hit the follow button, or better yet, share with your family, friends, or coworkers. In more than 28 years of corrections, I have used or supervised Pepperball hundreds of times. Now, as a master instructor for Pepperball, I teach others about the versatility and effectiveness of the Pepperball system. From cell extractions to disturbances on the rec yard, Pepperball is the first option in my correctional toolbox. With ranges up to 150 feet and hoppers that can hold 160 rounds, Pepperball is perfect for controlling large crowds or group disturbances on your yard. Pepperball allows for non-lethal direct impact to control inmates who refuse to comply with lawful orders, and area saturation allows you to achieve buffer zones between groups or use it for area denial to keep inmates away from security equipment and other accessible areas. To learn more about Pepperball, go to www.pepperball.com or click the link below in this show's information guide. Pepperball is the safer option first. Hello and welcome back to the Prison Officer Podcast. Today's guest is an associate professor of political science and political economy at Brown University, and he's also the author of two books, The Social Order of the Underworld, How Prison Gangs Govern the American Penal System, and The Puzzle of Prison Order, Why Life Behind Bars Varies Around the World. When many people outside the prison system think of prison gangs, they think of chaotic bands of violent racist thugs. Few people think of gangs as sophisticated organizations, often with elaborate written constitutions that regulate the social and economic life of the prison. Yet, as David argues, gangs form to create order among outlaws, producing alternative governance institutions to facilitate their legal activity. David studies the political economy of these gangs within our prison system globally, and his works have appeared in both economic and political science journals. If you haven't read his books yet, these are a great reference for all correctional officers. So welcome to the Prison Officer Podcast, David. Thank you, Mike. I'm delighted to be in conversation with you today. Absolutely. As with all the other interviews I do, I always like to start at the beginning, kind of see where a person came from. So tell me where you grew up. Uh, I grew up in San Jose, California. Um, I went to school at San Jose State. Um, I have a substantial number of friends um, who have been impacted in different ways from the criminal justice system, some who have been incarcerated, some who have worked in corrections. And uh, since I was in college, I've been very interested in American criminal justice system. I have a concern about mass incarceration and different aspects of um, corrections in the United States. And so that's sort of always been a little bit of a side interest uh, for me. Um, And so I was sort of familiar a bit uh, with some of these things um, when I was growing up in the Bay Area. And slightly by accident, I ended up spending uh, about 15 years of my academic life um, investigating and trying to understand the informal life of prisons, both in the United States and globally. Wow. So was there one specific person or friend that kind of impacted you that you knew growing up that kind of got you thinking about corrections? Sorry. Yeah. So um, I, I'd say I have a you know number of friends who have had you know s- sort of minor um, you know spells in the jail and and some a few longer uh, experiences. But when I was in college, uh, a, a good friend's uncle got out of um, prison. Had been um, served about ten years, uh, maximum security prisons in California. And when he was out, I was a sort of curious college student, and I asked, you know, how do you stay safe in prison? And the first thing he said instantly was the gangs. The gangs control everything. And I just thought that was so interesting and surprising. And I thought, you know, gangs making you feel safe in prison, that's not the impression that I would get from sort of casual observation. And so, you know, I had a large number of conversations uh, with him about it uh, as an undergraduate. And then later in graduate school, I had the opportunity to sort of uh, pursue it on a more scholarly level. Um, And so my first paper was about the internal organization of gangs. And this one particular gang, uh, at least at its founding, had a written constitution. It had a sort of statement of purpose. It had articles and sections. And it elaborated really a a, a system of government. And so uh, in in, in grad school, as I was studying economics, we were using economic tools to understand political constitutions. And so I wanted to see if I could use those same models of political constitutions to understand, you know, what we might call a criminal constitution. 
And I was surprised to find that uh, we, we very much could. And so I sort of wrote a paper about uh, this one topic, which was, you know, how did the gangs organize internally in this particular instance? And I thought, you know, I had an answer, but it raised a bunch of other questions. Why do they exist now when they didn't exist forever? What are the consequences of their operation? How do they establish trust? How do they identify people in a world where you can't have legally certified documents? Um, and so it's just sort of unfolded a bit in trying to really understand what's going on. That's interesting that you say that, that it's uh, kind of grown and exploded in the last several decades. But, and I read that in your book, and I, I do have a question, though. If you go back and look at different times in history, it seems like when you have individuals who don't have large communities or families, take a look at England, you know, in the late 1800s, lots of orphans running the streets, gangs kind of grew up. Uh, take a look at the cowboys in the Wild West. You know, gangs kind of grew up. Uh, so it seems like when there's not that family or that community uh, there to support them, that people tend to gravitate towards other people of their kind. Is, is that a fair assessment? I think that's exactly right, which is that um, in the California prison system, I was sort of surprised that the manifestation of gangs in California today, nothing like them as systematized and organized existed for more than 100 years in California. And so I was like, you know, that's curious. Why is that the case? Now, of course, there may have been groups of people who have, you know, you know, hung out with each other, cliques and stuff like that earlier. There's no doubt in that. Um, but in studying the gangs and, and the lack of gangs at certain times, it did make me step back and look at the broader picture. And there are these bodies of self-organization, these sort of groups that form when they can't rely on family or the state to adjudicate social interactions. And in fact, after I finished writing my book, I began reading histories of clan-based societies. And clan-based societies operate a lot like the gangs in California today. Everyone has to affiliate with the group. The group members are responsible for each member's action, so they regulate people very seriously. That's what gives rise to some of this um, female control in, in many of these clan-based societies. And reputation and standing between groups is of the utmost importance. And so as I'm reading about the clans, I'm like, this is a lot like the California prison system. And when you look at where clans have proliferated, it's in places that are fairly large communities that don't have strong and effective states to enforce the social order. And that essentially is why I argue gangs form in very centralized ways in some prisons. So yeah, I think there's this whole um, plethora of groups. They range in terms of effectiveness and desirability and criminality. Uh, but I think there is this natural tendency to group up for protection, for security, um, you know, for governance, when you can't rely just on family, just on religion, or just on a church. It's, there's an extra legal form of governance that emerges. Right. Yeah, people, they need that. They definitely do. And like you talked about, some of that's for safety. Some of it's for just social, I think. Mm -hmm. So I want to go to your book here real quick and uh, read from here. The Economic Way of Thinking. Prison gangs appear baffling. Many people associate their lifestyle, organization, monikers, activities, rituals, and customs with non-traditional forces. Oddities of the criminal underworld seem attributable only to psychopathy or pure evil. The actions rise among the puzzling questions. Why do murderous prison gangs avenge the death of unknown children? Why do clandestine groups get prominent tattoos that reveal their membership? Why is prison the only safe place that middle-aged men join gangs? Why does racism permeate prison at a time when society is more tolerant than ever before? And why didn't gangs exist for the first hundred years of the California prison system? Uh, now it dominates them. Why do the most dangerous inmates keep the peace? And why do people join gangs that they can never leave even after release? Uh, we explain these puzzles by simply calling inmates evil, stupid, or crazy. These are not actions of traditional men. On the contrary, the only way to st the only way to understand prison gangs is to study their members as rational people. This book uses economics to explain the seemingly traditional, truly astounding, and often tragic world of prison life. So. You you look at this and you, you started into it from the view of economics and politics um, as opposed to the criminality of it. So you came at it a whole different direction. I don't know that there's been that many other people do that. 
Uh, that's right. And I think, you know, I'm in constant conversation with criminologists, but we approach the world looking through a very different lens. And so my first instinct isn't to think about crime and criminality um, or deviancy. My first assumption or presumption is to say these are unusual practices, but they're sustained. There's something persistent about them. They know the constraints and the knowledge mm -hmm. of time and place that they face far better than I do. So let me just presume at the start that what they're doing makes sense from their perspective. And maybe that will help me to discover mm -hmm. the internal logic or the hidden logic of what they're doing, rather than just coming in and saying, these people like to commit crime, these people like to commit violence. Prisons have always been filled with people who like to commit crime and violence. Why did they organize in gangs today, but not before? And why did they engage in certain practices and not before? And so I think the, the rational choice or economic approach provides a degree of autonomy and agency to people. And rather than just saying, you know, these people have lost it, it's to just sort of say, maybe, maybe that is the answer, but let's not start with that as the answer. Let's investigate whether there's an internal logic that mm -hmm. makes sense. And so from the economist perspective, that's always the presumption. The people on the ground, they know what they're doing. They're responding rationally. It's up to us to uncover why that's so. Absolutely. Um, I think before I read your book, I almost completely explained it away with their, they form their own community because they need the same things inside that they do outside. And I wrote an article a long time ago for um, the, the art. I was responding to an article and they talked about, you know, uh, when shit hits the fan and the end of the world comes, I think they were talking about whether, whether silver pieces or 22 bullets were going to be more popular, you know, at the time. And my article talked about the fact that, it's going to be just like prison. You're going to have a sandwich man who steals lettuce and tomato and bread from from the kitchen and makes sandwiches and sells them for a bigger price. You're going to have prostitution. You're going to have drugs. You're going to all this stuff is needed by people, and there's always going to be somebody to fill that. So I think that's the way that my brain went at it, and I didn't until I read your book look at the governance of it. But there is a governance attribute to this where they are forming a complete government in there. And I've seen the manifestos that you talk about. So that's interesting that you came that direction with the economics. Follow the money. Isn't that what they always say? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I think, um, you know, there are sort of, you know, what's fascinating as a, as a social scientist more generally about studying prisons is that we can investigate some of the most important themes and questions in the social sciences. So how do we allocate resources to where they're most highly desired? How do we um, regulate the use of violence? Where do institutions of exchange come from? How, how and how well do they work? And then, you know, the, the classic Madisonian question from the Federalist Papers is that he says, we, we want a government that is strong enough to protect our rights, but we want to constrain it so it doesn't violate our rights. And I think that's like a major question that we can get some analytical leverage on mm -hmm. in the prison setting. And so, you know, the, the needs that you, you mentioned of the, you know, the sandwich guy, that's, that's, that, that was true 100 years ago. It'll be 100 years from now. And the sort of economic angles to say, well, what are the institutional <laughs> settings in which that sandwich man can make his deals in the most peaceful and efficient way? And they set that up, that, that governance that they have allows him to run a business, uh, even though he's taxed, even though he's also got that protection. Same thing happens on the street with Italian mafia in New York uh, happened for years. I, I listened to your Ted talk. Also, you had a Ted talk back in 2015 and I guess the, what you were asking about or what you were talking about in there was how we can have smaller jails and, um, so that you don't have these big, huge, unknown jails where nobody knows anybody, and that causes some of this gang culture. And one of the things you talked about in there, which I don't think um, most most of the public doesn't understand, they think correctional officers protect inmates, and we absolutely do. And there's a there's an you're always going to find a couple of bad ones, but there are thousands and thousands of correctional officers who go to work every day protecting the public and protecting those in their charge. But I've been in housing units with 200 inmates, um, and I'm, I'm supposed to pay attention to everything that's going on. I can't do it. So tell me a little bit about what you said about that. 
Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think that certainly in the U.S., there's a presumption that correctional officers are a primary source of safety. And in a lot of prisons, I don't think that's true. In the argument, I, I essentially argue that in small prison populations, um, there's these sort of informal mechanisms that are really good that are enforcing the social order. Things like os- ostracism and gossip, those are powerful social mechanisms in small communities. Because when your reputation falls and people gossip about you, it hurts. And when you're ostracized, there's no one else to turn to. <laughs> and those things are also really effective because they don't require a lot of resources or social collective action. So they're easy to implement at low cost and they're highly effective. But in when you move from small communities to mm-hmm. large communities and often more diverse communities, both of those things become much less effective very quickly. You can't possibly know 500 people's reputations. So gossip is not nearly stinging as much, not hurting as much. If you ostracize someone from one group, Mm -hmm. there may be 400 other people for them to interact with who don't know anything about your reputation. So these very low-cost social penalties very quickly became ineffective in California around the 1950s and 60s. And in the historical context of California, that's where I see a big spike in violence. There's more stabbings. There's more rioting. And universally, the people who worked and live in prisons in those days say that the initial gangs there, groups like the Mexican Mafia and the Nuestra Familia, they all form initially for personal protection. And from that, they grow into these broader governing Mm -hmm. entities. So I do think that the size of the community limits the ability for incarcerated people to rely on decentralized things, and it also makes it harder for correctional staff to um, you know, create the safety in the first place. Absolutely. Um, and when you go back to what even started our penal systems in America, you know, you look early on and capital punishment and corporal punishment, those were the two things. And the corporal punishment was usually some form of embarrassment that kept a person in check in their little community. But then as people, you know, as communities grew and people moved away and um, they weren't affected as much by that corporal punishment that they saw on the square, putting somebody in the stocks, making them wear, you know, they used to make them wear some silly helmets and stuff. Or I know there's one mask that's got big lips on it because somebody gossiped and they had to wear that around the community. So that that makes sense to me. Um, I want to throw something else out though. Because one of the things that I see when you look back at the history of incarcerated people in America, at least, um, the rise of the federal government, that was when crime started being punished at a whole different level. And prohibition falls in right about then. The The beginning of the Federal Bureau of Prisons is, of course, back there in the, the early 1900s. It stayed very small. It was in just three prisons. And then prohibition comes in, we start having federal laws, and we start incarcerating people. California started having huge drug problems, and they start incarcerating people on just this huge level. So some of our society, societal norms, societal effects are what grew those prisons to those points. And I don't know, that. do you think we can ever bring that back? Uh, that's a That's a good question. I mean... Some of the rise in incarceration in California was just a booming population in general, right? And then you add in additional laws. I mean, I think the mass incarceration begins somewhere in the 1930s. With the FBI, you see a big increase when the war on poverty turns into the war on crime. Um, The United States is a very punitive place. Um, There's a lot of homicides here relative to sort of Western European countries. There's a lot of guns here. Um, I Typically, my, my sort of you know historical and loose take is that there were pockets of concentrated ur- urban poverty that was not replaced by new uh, manufacturing jobs, which gave rise to violence, which invoked a very harsh punitive response from across the political spectrum, um, across um, ethnic backgrounds. And in the 1990s, in the 80s, well, the 60s through the 90s, I think it made perfect sense But the problem is that it's easy to ramp up, but it's very difficult to ramp down, right? Socially and politically, we can't just say, okay, you're serving life, but, you know, we'll let you out now. So it's an easy thing to start and turn on, but it's a hard and maybe impossible thing to turn off. So uh, I'm not super optimistic that in 50 years, the U.S. won't be an extreme outlier, both for political and underlying social reasons. Yeah. And I wonder if some of the some of the criminality, some of the prosecutions were handed back to the local jurisdictions. 
And yes, there's less money there. There's some problems there because I've been to some of the really small jails and there's nothing there for an incarcerated person. But if we did that locally as opposed to federally, I, I think that there might be a chance to do that on the smaller scale that you talked about. But I don't ever see the the bigger governments making that happen. That's just me. I want to go to your book here because one of the things we talk about, you know, officers get a, a bad rap with a lot of stuff. I'm going to go to your book. When officers learn of an assault, uncertainty about what happened may make it infeasible to do anything. Inmates sometimes falsely accuse others of theft or assault, and officers have to have to have little information to judge the veracity of such claims. Inmates might intentionally harm themselves to go to get time away from a person prison job or to move away from a preferred cell block or move to a preferred cell block. That's something that we deal with as officers all the time. We talk about inmates and convicts. You talk about that convict code. That convict code... When I first started in this, you could still find some convicts. You could go to them. You could get a straight answer. And sometimes that answer was, you know, F you. I'm not telling you. But it was a straight answer. Um, Prisons changed in the last 20, 30 years. And there isn't that convict code that you talked about. They will lie a lot more. They will do things that at one time were considered just breaking of prison rules. And inmates don't have, except to their gangs, any, um, the inmates won't take care of each other. They'll only take care of their gangs now. So that's one of the things that I've seen is that the gangs have caused the greater prison not to take care of itself. The convict code, like you said, is is dead. Yeah, I, I think that um, empowering um, you know, or allowing groups to empower themselves shifts the balance of power between um, correctional staff and prisoners more generally and, and gang shot callers. So it's not benign that there's this new source of governance. It changes what's happening. And you would know more than I would on the sort of day to day about all of this stuff. But, uh, you know, to, you know, there's some value in dispersing power amongst large groups of people um, because it forces people to come to the bargaining table and have discussions. And I, I wonder if in some situations it's, it's more two strong bodies who sort of have very little incentive to defer and, um, you know, coordinate in in some mutually beneficial way. Right. And it's interesting. I do want to bring that up. I I told you off camera that you did a great job writing this book. Uh, You got a lot of things right in here. Um, and I ask you if you ever worked in prison because it just, it, it kind of blew me away that you got things so accurately in a lot of these, these pages, how did you do that? How many interviews did you do? What, how did you get the information that you got for this book? That's something I'd like to know. Uh, it, it was a, a years-long, uh, very difficult process. Um, some of it was sort of formal research. Some of it was a bit informal. So um, I'm not an ethnographer. I am an economist. So when I first started writing this book, the idea of speaking to people as a form of data collection, that wasn't like a thing. And so uh, but obviously, I learned a lot. So I, I spoke with a lot of formerly incarcerated people. Uh, I talked with some police officers in the Bay Area, some county jail sheriffs, uh, people uh, who I had personal relationships with. Um, I visited San Quentin, uh, talked to a lieutenant, some of the COs there. Uh, I've spoken with gang investigations people there, recently released um, people. Um, so that's sort of one thing. That was my sort of informal, let's have conversations with people whose boots are dirty from sort of both sides of the fence, so to speak. Um, I then studied very closely the mm-hmm. ethnographic and the sociological studies of California. And California, for a variety of reasons, has a very rich and long history, right? There are, there are famous criminologists who were in prison and became sociologists and wrote books about the California prison system in the 50s and 60s. And so that allows me to reach back and get a snapshot of the social order many decades ago. And there's been studies from the 1950s and 60s up through the present looking at men's prisons in California. So there's a sort of secondary literature that was available there. Um, I then turned to collecting my own archival uh, data and evidence. The Department of Corrections, um, if you look closely enough, you can find annual reports going back basically to 1850 when the prison was created. And so that provided me some quantitative data about how demographics are changing that I then sort of mapped onto, well, what are the qualitative accounts saying about these things? So it's essentially taking and then, you know, uh, hundreds or thousands probably of, of pages of indictments and court documents and 
Court of Appeals assessments. So the, the goal was let's get as much information from as many different perspectives and see if there's some coherent story that you can triangulate across these things. There's a lot of data that I wish I had that would help me maybe more precisely test my argument, but it seemed like a pretty consistent story was coming through here. And to go back to uh, your comment mm-hmm. about um, me as an economist earlier, there's a very well-established theory that was used to explain European state formation hundreds of years ago that looks a lot similar to the argument that I make in this context. And this argument about the size of the population and the centralization of hmm. the governance institutions, we see it in many, many different places. So I was like, you know, if it worked in Eastern, uh, you know, if it worked in European state formation and it worked over here and it worked in the frontier and it worked in Latin America, maybe it'll work in prison too. And so I had a hunch and I had a theoretical um, a tip, a hint about what to look for. And so sort of the combination of a well-established theory and hmm. imperfect, but rich sources of evidence. Um, I, I just put it in the book and I, and leave it yeah. to the reader to judge, um, you know, how, how compelling it is. Right. One of the things that California has for you to study is the fact that it's considered by almost everybody, the, the birthplace of the prison gang, what we know of these days as the prison gang and several of the biggest ones started right there at San Quentin. So that was just a, a wonderful place for you to, to be able to go study some of that. And anybody that you talk to says that the reason those prison gangs formed was racism and protection from the races. Do you think racism in prison exists because it's needed or it's just an easy way to divide groups? Do do you still think these days that it's a needed thing or is it just easy to go? I'm a black guy. You're a black guy. I'm a white guy. You're a white guy. I think race is incredibly complicated and interesting in the prison system, especially in California. And so in the book, you know, you might think that gangs form to promote hateful racist ideologies. And that seems totally plausible. The tattoos alone, the names, the words they use is as sort of prejudiced, racially prejudiced as as you can get. Um, But what what was striking to me is that if you look at measures of the general population, I mean, outside of prison, Measures of outright racial prejudice have been dropping, falling dramatically since the 1940s, yet at the same time that in general people are becoming less outwardly racist, there's an emergence of these gangs that are purported to be there forming for racist reasons. And so that made me a little skeptical. Also, in the qualitative accounts of San Quentin in the 60s, the description was of a much more inter-ethnic social life than what you see today. And so I thought both of those are very curious. And and so so what I'm sort of at now is that, you know, there's there's clearly racists in prison, there are clearly racists in gangs. And so I don't want to diminish any of that. I want to just sort of stipulate that that, that seems to be pretty obviously true to me. Um, but it, it seems it's also serving an, an additional function, which is that, you know, my argument earlier is that in small communities where we know everyone, you know people's reputations, and that does a lot of work for us. But when you have big populations, you don't know mm-hmm. people's reputations. And in fact, you may not even know who they who they hang with, right? You don't know what crew they're with, who, you know, which car are they in. And, and so one way in a society of strangers that we might sort of naturally divide is what are low-cost ways to know that I don't know you, you're a stranger, but I know who to complain about your behavior to. And two ways it seems in prison that they do that are one, mm-hmm. race – And then two, obviously, tattoos, right? You can know what neighborhood, what block someone grew up on, and then very naturally know who to complain to if they treat you poorly. So I do believe that in low information environments, um, the the sort of racial and ethnic sorting is providing, along with the tattoos, some information in a way that I don't think you need it when prison populations were smaller. In my most recent book, I look at the English men's prisons – which are interesting. They're not the same, obviously, as the United States or California, um, but they have very small prisons. Uh, Their typical prison is about 700 people. Wings hold about 50 people only. They don't have organized gangs. It actually looks a lot like the convict code now. Um, And they talk about how there's no, you know, you know, there's no racial um, segregation. There's no, there's no conflict along racial or ethnic lines. They, they intermix fluidly. And so that's a sort of another example where it seems like in small communities, 
We don't need these tells. But in big societies of strangers, we need to know who, who holds this person responsible for the way that they're acting. And it seems like race may play one part in that. Right, right. One of the things you touch on in your book is that even though they divide themselves on these racial lines, that that's always dependent upon the situation. Because I have seen uh, ABs sit down with Mexican amis and do drugs together. I've seen, um, you know, them enforce for each other. I've seen the, the prison gangs that just would fight on the yard if one of them stuck another one. But when it comes time to do business, like I said earlier, follow the money. And it seems like all bets are off. They'll, they'll get along for money. They'll get along to get drugs in the prison. That's one of the things people don't realize. I think I think that's right. Yeah. And, and you know, I had a lot of guys say, look, I'm not racist, but this is a racist environment and I don't make the rules. And they live a life outside of prison and they have people who are black, white, Hispanic. Uh, a guy that I knew was telling me about his um, – you know the the riots are anticipated in, in often in California and, and so often people will know when they're coming and say you know mm -hmm. uh, black guy is his friend and they, you know they can't be sort of very tight in public but he's like when the riot happens we'll fight each other but we'll just like kind of not really try to stab each other in the face right we'll just box and it was you know it was a, a clear like this is not like motivated primarily for that there's a very self interested often you know monetary motivated reason when that's going to matter and then other times when it's symbolic and you can indulge in all of the hateful language that you want to absolutely what surprised you the most during your research as far as what you found out because you're you're also in a way you're like a civilian you haven't been in prison you haven't worked in there but you've you've seen a lot because of your studies what what was the most surprising thing that you saw going on in prison that you didn't know necessarily happened that's a great question you know, partly just because I, I learned so much when I was writing the book and I was just uh, constantly mm -hmm. surprised. Um, you know, the, the, the degree to which they have pretty coherent and, you know, sophisticated in a sense, political documents and organization was, I, I think, one thing that surprised me, um, you know, you know, a lot. The other is the ability for certain gangs to control the street gangs on the outside. And I think that a lot of people just assume that problems in prison stay in prison. But in the Bay Area, in LA, the gangs that control the county jails, they're taxing drug dealers on the streets, they're calling for hits, they're adjudicating conflicts. In, you know, Southern California, they're, they're sending rules out to the street gangs about why you can't do drive-by shootings anymore. And those aren't just performative acts. They actually have consequences. And I, and I think that was, that was maybe the, one of the most surprising things that I had seen because, you know, often, you know, civilians, as you put it, we, we don't know how porous prison walls are. And a lot of what happens in prison is either because people are going to get out eventually, and most of them are, or because even while still locked up, they have a huge influence on the way that crime happens on our streets. And I think that's maybe underappreciated um, more than most of the things that I uh, learned about when I wrote the book. Interesting. Um, I think a lot of people don't know the way that some of those gang members look at incar and incarceration as just part of the business. They plan for when they're going back. They do things to stay in. And maybe you mentioned it in this book uh, because they're making so much money at one spot. Why would I want to leave? Because this money's getting funneled in and out to their, their people. It's taking care of their family. Um, and I don't think people look at it as a business opportunity. And a lot of the gangs, this is pure business. I'm going to do some time. I'm going to get out and go spend some money. I'm going to go back and do some time. Did you see a lot of that? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think there's there's certainly plenty of people who said, my street rep's going up if I do a little time in jail or a couple of years in the States. And, you know, if, if you can, you know, control a drug trade in a in a wing, yeah, I mean, there's some degree in which you're actually protected from rival drug dealers. You may have something like a monopoly supply on the drugs that are coming in. Um, you don't have to worry about a lot of other things in life. I mean, despite the you know many deprivations of of incarceration. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's you know I sort of think about there are some people who are you know very irrationally committing crimes, going to jail. They're not good at planning. They're impetuous. Uh, but there's some contingent, some percentage of people mm -hmm. who are very strategically interacting with the criminal justice system. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
And you mentioned a couple of the, the bigger games, of course, the Norteños, the Mexicanomy, Aryan Brotherhood. Aryan Brotherhood's one that I've, uh, I worked at Leavenworth, and uh, so I got to see a lot of the Aryan Brotherhood, the federal ones come through there. California has the California AB, but they're very similar in a lot of their methods. And I always look at prison through the, or try to, through the, the prism of hi- history. You know, is this something we'd see at other times? And one thing I noticed in the California system was, oh, it was probably the 90s, maybe the early 2000s. The ABs out there started imploding. They started coming down on each other. They were killing each other. They were telling on each other. And there was a bunch of this going on. And it seemed to me, if you look back through history, you've always seen kings and dictators. When they get to a certain level of power, they start getting paranoid. And then they start killing off everybody around them. And so that was another way that I saw, I don't know, kind of this governmental influence infiltrating a gang was you got those top guys who became paranoid. Yeah. And and I think that's right is, you know, we shouldn't think, you know, constitutional democracy, we should think like an autocrat or a dictatorship, like a small group of people who have a vast amount of power, um, I mean, my understanding is that some of the gangs responded to that. Um, so my, you know, the the sort of info that I was told is that you know the Mexican mafia historically it, it had been like there's one guy on top, but everybody wanted to be that one guy, and so they sort of broke it down to these mesas, these tables of people in different yards, so that you didn't have to take over the one guy to go to the top. You could have a place of leadership. You could have a place of power. So there's more power sharing that happened around there. And, you know, one of the correctional officers, you know, I was, you know, he was sort of saying that some of the black gangs in prisons, they're not as organized as the Hispanic gangs and especially the Mexican mafia. And he said that that was one reason. He thought everyone wanted to be the mm-hmm. guy on top and there was just constant turnover. So the, the internal regulation of power and violence, um, I think that's a very delicate balance. In my book, I try to give the sense that we should be sort of impressed with how well they've done, but also noting that, you know, it's not, you know, if, if any of our jobs were run like this, we would find it to be, you know, terribly organized. So it depends what your sort of comparison case is. Uh, but that's a major mm-hmm. challenge to them. And, and sort of yeah. from us as outsiders, or at least me as an outsider perspective, maybe that's a, you know, in some ways, it's a good thing that they're not able to be more organized. But the downside is the violence and conflict when it's not stable. Absolutely. And, and we caused some of that. Um, you know, when we got in there and we tried to do some of the RICO charges on, or we did successfully, the federal government did RICO charges on some of the bigger gangs. And if we didn't do anything else, and you can never, as much as people watch TV and think in movies that you could put an inmate in solitary confinement and he's he's safe from everything now, that guy's still communicating institution to institution. Um, I worked at the federal medical center. Uh, there were a lot of inmates who would injure themselves for the simple fact that they would get to go to the medical center at the same time somebody else was there and could relay information to the gang and then send it back out to the gang members. So we saw a lot of that also, just how ingenious they are. And and like you said, how, how these gangs uh, – a governmental, and you you said that several times in your book. It's it's almost like a governmental organization. It truly is. So tell me a little bit about your the new book. Kind of expands out to uh, more of a global community, and that's something I've seen since I've started this podcast. Uh, I think we're up to close to sixty different countries that have listened to this podcast. I, I just didn't think about that. So what are you seeing globally? I know that you reached out in this last book. Yeah, I, you know, so there hasn't been a lot of cross-country comparisons of the informal life of prisons. And, um, you know, I, I guess I sort of start the book by making an argument that by definition and practice, prisons everywhere are very similar institutions. They uh, take people who have been charged with or convicted of a crime. It's not randomly selecting people. Uh, they're forced to go there. Um, across the world, they come disproportionately from disadvantaged socioeconomic communities. While incarcerated, in an important sense, people have no choice with whom they interact. And they, can, they can't choose to leave. You can't just exit. And each one of those things, from a social science perspective, should make us you know, think this is going to be a less cooperative environment. This, 
rather than if you have exit options and someone's bad, you can just take off. That's, that's not available. So, so these are like substantively and theoretically really important things. And as far as I can tell, that's prisons everywhere. So the strange thing, why I call it a puzzle in the book, is because the informal life of prisons in these same institutions – looks wildly different. In some places, prisoners have a ton of solidarity. They work effectively with collective action and have a big influence on the everyday life of a prison. In other places, there's no collective action. There's very little influence. In some prisons, that influence comes in very centralized ways, like the gangs in California, like the gangs in Brazil, uh, like the communities in Bolivian prisons. Um, in other places, um, it's through these decentralized mechanisms, women's prisons, English prisons, Nordic prisons. So the, the degree to which prisoners have an influence and the manifestation of that influence looks very, very different. And so the goal of the book is to just sort of take a first step and say, well, why does – the California prison system for men looks so different from Bolivian prisons, looks so different from Nordic prisons, looks so different from men's English prisons, looks so different from women's California prisons, looks so different from the gay and transgender dorm in Los Angeles. And so I sketch, you know, what is in the long run surely won't be right, but like the first sketches of why we might think that this variation happens so much. So it's interesting that you bring up women because talk to me a little bit about what you saw with when you studied the women, because they don't necessarily form big prison gangs like we see in the male prisons, although they do have their own little communities that they trust and lean on. Uh, tell me a little bit about what you saw there. The women's prisons are a fascinating case. I, I haven't um, spoken with, interviewed, or visited women's prisons, so that's entirely based on uh, six sort of foundational books in the study of women's prison order in California, uh, going from the 1960s to the present. Mm -hmm. And it's striking because, as you know, they don't have gangs like the men's prison systems do. Um, by most accounts, they're not racially segregated like men's prisons are. Um, it's an individual <laughs> reputation that matters rather than the group. That sounds a lot like the convict code. They describe norms of behavior that are very similar to the convict code of men's prisons in the 50s and 60s. Um, they, don't, they do form play families on occasion, fictive kinships as we call them in the academic literature. Um, but the, the families are not permanent right. like gang membership is. They're also not mutually exclusive. There's a family that has aunts and uncles and cousins and other branches. So responsibility is not as clearly delineated. In most of the accounts, women also don't ask for papers from newly incarcerated people in the way that in men's prisons, they systematically identify why are you here, what crimes have you committed, because they don't want to tolerate certain offenders, whereas in women's prisons, they tend to do that less so. And so what's interesting is that, you know, women at certain times are, are literally in prisons that previously held men. The regulation of men's and women's prisons has been very similar for a very long time, similar oversight legally and politically. So why is it that there's been so much stability in women's prisons from the 1960s to the present in the face of this radical change in the way that men's social order changes? And, you know, so it, there's probably lots of reasons, but one that certainly is consistent with my argument is that women's prisons in California have never had large prison populations like men's prisons did. In fact, oh. women's prisons have never had the, a larger population as they did when men first started forming gangs. So I think they've always remained in this relatively smaller environment where gossip and ostracism are actually really effective. So why would you go to the bother of coming up with the gang and coming up with the power structures and investigating everybody? So I think that's an interesting close comparison case. Um, gender might play a role as well. Um, you know, Past experiences with violence and different types of crimes could all feed into that as well. Um, I don't want the women's prison population to grow to the size of men's prisons population. That would be an interesting uh, test. Um, and I don't know what it would show. But, you know, the, the fact that they remain these relatively small but still diverse communities seems to suggest that size uh, of the population seems to matter. And size of the population. And, and you saw that in Europe and some of the others because you go to South America and there are some once again, there's some huge uh, prison populations down there, mostly all just lumped together with very little. Um, you know, officials overlooking, you have a lot of gangs down there. Did you see the smaller prison size in Europe and other places? So that's, uh, that's what's a little tricky is that across Latin America, they have some very large, very overcrowded 
prisons, but also some that are uh, smaller and still overcrowded, but smaller. What's so different about them from, say, California is that prison official presence is essentially zero. They may provide some basic food, some, maybe basic access to water and electricity. Otherwise, prisoners rely entirely on resources from visitors and family. And they have sort of market economies within the prison that they're able to openly operate uh, and rely upon to, to gain resources to survive. Uh, and there's a lot of extra legal governance in these, far more than in California. There are um, prisoner committees that are often elected, sometimes appointed by prison officials. They make the rules. They fix the prisons. They regulate uh, social mm -hmm. interactions. So when prison officials don't provide governance, resources, um, then there's scope for prisoners to provide those things. There's a demand for them to provide those things. When you go to the Nordic system or the English prison system, it's most extreme in, in the Nordic system. They have both lots of official resources, very effective governance and administration, but also very small prisons. Their prisons hold, you know, on average of about 60 people. There's zero overcrowding in their prison systems. They have a lot of resources. So the incarcerated people have very little reason to invest in gangs or anything like that. They, they have an abundance in some ways um, in those prisons. So there's not a lot of reason for them to invest in this sort of extra legal or gang-like organization. Interesting. I think uh, I think the term therapeutic community also came from the Nordic system. I had a, a former warden on here not too long ago, and I worked at a, a, a camp, minimum security, and they brought in uh, a drug treatment that was based on therapeutic community. And all of the things you're talking about were part of that. It was a smaller group of people. They were encouraged to be truthful, to to step to one another if the other person was doing something wrong, which in, you know, Leavenworth, you're not going to see that one person's not getting involved in another person's uh, actions, but in this therapeutic community, they were expected to do it or they could be part of the problem. They were expected to talk to staff and bring those problems to staff and then work as a group to fix the, the individual's problem as a community. So that's interesting. I've kind of seen a little bit of that. That environment is one that you know makes me you know more optimistic that maybe there's some rehabilitation in prison. But I, I was also I'm sort of curious what your thoughts are in that you know so many Department of Corrections have and rehabilitation in the name, and it's often in the mission statement. And I gosh, I just when I visited prisons, I think you know how much rehabilitation could happen to somebody here, and are we really you know are we are we really you know, do we really need to say that? You know, is that is that is that buying us anything? Is there any is there any return on on that investment? In that I'm just curious if you if you had any thoughts from your experience. I will say that I'm a little bit jaded, and I do think, and I, I saw that therapeutic community, I saw that therapeutic community at Ozark Correctional Center, and it did work. Those inmates were given opportunities to learn and to make money that most inmates couldn't. And one of the things I've watched over the years is. We will take an inmate and kick him out the front door and go, here's your $13 and 27 cents. Now don't come back to prison. Uh, they have no options. You know, these guys were allowed to work. They built up savings accounts that sometimes had ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. Uh, so they had options when they got out of prison, they could go pay first and month, last month's rent. They could buy a little car. You know, some of them got to keep the job they had in prison when they got out of prison. So, but that was a very special uh, deal. Now in mainline prisons that I've worked at, which I've worked at a couple of penitentiaries. And this may be a little bit of arrogance on my part, but I can 99% of the time tell you who's coming back to prison and who's not. Um, you have guys that come through the door. They're humble. They know they've made a mistake. They're looking for ways to improve their self. Um, and they're going to do anything they can to get there. Now that's not to say that our prison system isn't set up to make a lot of people fail. Even the ones that, that, want to make it because you can absolutely go get in a big dorm and end up in a gang fight, stick somebody. And now you're going to be in prison for a long time. And that does happen. But what we do in prison isn't based. It's based on what makes the community feel good. It's not based on what works for those guys. Um, you've got to bring them in and give them opportunities that they understand that they can do something with. Like you said, most of them are poor and disadvantaged. Um, that's where a lot of the crime comes from. So that's kind of what I saw. I'd love to see them give them more basic skills and 
I will say that we're talking about gangs here. Gangs do some of that to take care of their own, but gangs also prevent a lot of the rehabilitation that we could do in prison. Because if the the shot caller says, you're not going to class, I got this for you to do. You're not going to class, you know? So uh, there's a dichotomy there that uh, always doesn't yep. work. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. It's a tricky situation. I also think that um, corrections is um, um, from, from an outsider's perspective, you know, corrections departments are asked to solve a lot of problems that are created outside of its sphere and that have been created, you know, maybe for years and decades to come and you don't get to decide who's coming to you mm-hmm. and then they leave. And it's almost an impossible task to sort of ask people to not just contain in a secure place and keep them fed, but also to moral improvement. That's uh, that's a big ask in any setting and, and just maybe as much so in a, in a prison. Yeah. And I, I've talked to uh, I've taught a lot of young rookies as they come into the system as correctional officers, and I didn't notice it when I first started. But as I got older and got to know some inmates better, were longer term with them at an institution, I did have them come up to me and, and tell me that watching me and how I handled myself or how I came to work every day uh, made a difference to them because they hadn't seen that. And I've tried to pass that on to rookies because I think in your European systems, not that I agree with everything they do, but they do have this thought that the officers can be a bigger part of the rehabilitation than I think we have in America. You know, we don't use the term guard anymore, but a lot of what we do is guarding. We're not, we're not out there like a police officer is. There's no dare program in prison for officers to be a part of, you know, to help, uh, inmates. That's just something that's kind of shunned. Uh, and I do think we could do more of that, although I do believe it's ostracized by both the gangs and uh, the correctional officers. Uh, it's kind of a weird place to walk around in the middle there. I can imagine. Did you go to South America? Was that one of the places that you got to? No, I the the goal of this book, which took me basically ten years to write, <laughs> um, in starts and you know fits and starts, wow. um, was to to take take stock of the um, the literature, and so American prison ethnographies used to be very popular, and they sort of waned at the time we needed them most in the nineteen eighties and nineties. Um, it's res- there's been some resurgence, but you know ethnography in prisons in the U.S. is actually a pretty big ask in most places. Um, but there's a proliferation across Europe and Latin America and Africa of prison ethnographers doing what they did in the U.S. in the 50s, 60s, and 70s in those places. And so we're just now, for the first time, able to sort of step back and say, what does the landscape of ethnographies look like? So I use individual ethnographies as data in a sort of broader comparative analysis. And um, someday I would like to visit, you know, some of those prisons. You know, you can't, there's, you know, it took me long enough to write the book to have to have, to have traveled to and spent time in all those prisons, I think would have made the project infeasible. Um, but my hope is that there's a sort of global community of prison ethnographers that we can start sort of coordinating and speaking across our particular sites. So they, they explain single sites very, very well, but some of the specific details that do the lot of explaining don't exist in other places. So we need theories that can explain across different prisons, and that's the sort of part of the ambition of the project is to push a more comparative perspective in the study of prison social order. And I think the study of prisons isn't what it used to be. I'm kind of giving a little clue to an upcoming podcast here, but one of the things I'm going to do is um, – Back in the 1930s, uh, one of the first directors of the Bureau of Prisons wrote a a book called Prisons and Beyond, and he was considered a penologist. We don't really have that anymore. There aren't penologists out there who do the study of prisons. And and this is just from my viewpoint, but a lot of the study that's being done in prisons isn't how we do it, like you're doing, but it's more along the lines of how it's affecting the inmate population ton of studies that way, lots of psychology uh, uh, efforts being put in that direction. But how we run prisons, how prisons operate, that's kind of a lost art. And you're one of the few right now that's the do, doing anything with that. Yeah, I, th- I mean, that's really what's interesting is, is what is the structure of our social organization and where does the governance come from? How effective is it? Who's providing it? Um, who wins and loses? 
um, you know, there's comparative studies of prison incarceration rates, of recidivism rates, the psychological stuff. A um, lot of, that that has a lot of value, but it's it's a distinctly different topic than the sort of old school prison um, ethnography of someone like Gresham Sykes, the Society of Captives. Like that style of research in the academic world has has sort of fallen out of fashion in favor for you know, what's sometimes useful, but not always sort of simple statistical analysis of things that we can measure easily, but that may not get to the foundational and and core institutional things that we care about. How are you viewed among your peers in academia? Um, How does that fall? (laughs) Um, We we can skip that part if you want. (laughs) No, I, I I laugh because uh, it's it's great, but I'm a, I'm a strange one. So I, I got a PhD in economics, and I moved immediately into political science to study a topic usually studied by criminologists. And there's an arbitrage that's happening there, because criminologists don't have the theories that economists have or the empirical tools that political scientists have. And so I'm able to look at this thing that criminologists have spent many decades studying and to sort of give a new perspective. And some of them think it's great. Some are more skeptical. My political science and econ colleagues recognize that this isn't, quote, just about prisons. It's about asking these major questions in political economy that, you know, most of us are really interested in. And if we can get some leverage out of studying prisons to understand these broader social dynamics, and that's a good thing. But I'm a very unusual looking political scientist, and I'm very grateful that Brown has, uh, you know, willing to tolerate my my slightly unusual research interests. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um and you mentioned criminologist, and that's kind of what took over uh, for the peniology degrees or, or the study of prisons. But I am glad to see I've, – I've, I do some talks once in a while at some of the colleges. And for a long time, criminology degrees were only held by police officers. You didn't see hardly anybody coming out of the prison systems. So that's what they were teaching was policing. And I'm seeing that change. I'm seeing, and I've known a couple of people who've retired and went on into, um, you know, becoming professors and teaching uh, about criminal justice from a prisoner, from an institutional side. So I do think that's changing. So maybe we'll see some of that grow. What are you doing yeah, next? I hope so. Ten years on the last book. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm writing a journal articles. They come out a little quicker. Um, I'm interested in extrajudicial violence in Latin America. And so I, I think that regulation of violence is this fundamental job of the state, right? The monopoly control on the legitimate mm-hmm. use of violence. That's Max Weber's classic definition of the state. Um, but when we look around the world, there's certainly no monopoly on it. When the state uses it, it's not always legitimate. And lots of other people use it who are not the state. And the people in the community view it as legitimate. The vigilantism and lynching in many parts of Brazil, the community is excited about. And they're happy that it's happening, in part because the state can't do it, but also because they feel it's their right to punish offenders. And that's very different from the sort of traditional Western view of state and regulation of violence. And um, I want to understand that problem better. I think that it's an impediment to long-run political an economic development. It's one of these things that, oh, it, it maybe it works relatively better in the short run, but it means you can't reach sort of the level of development that many countries and, and people around the world aspire to. So I think that's sort of a, a, a hitching point, um, a, a breaking point in development from sort of poorly developed to fully developed. And so that's where I hope to spend the next couple of my um, years doing research in Brazil and understanding this, uh, this violence, uh, this extrajudicial violence. Very interesting, kind of reminiscent of the Old West, where there wasn't any overset law and order, so uh, they took it in their own. Wow. So I I, I spent uh, a year on sabbatical at Berkeley Law School, uh, a wonderful interdisciplinary group there, um, looking through archives of sort of frontier societies and the mining camps and frontier justice. And I, I assumed when I turned to Brazil that there might be similar themes, this idea that if the state's not there to enforce against crime control, then people will. And that's not really what we see when we go down there. It, right. it turns out that there's something more along the lines of an honor culture in operation in Brazil. Uh, it's a status thing in a way like the gangs, which is that the police don't have the right to enforce this crime. The family has the right to enforce that crime. And in some sense, it's, it's sort of saying, look, this justice won't be served by the police punishing them. 
Justice is only served when we punish them. And so the actions are similar to sort of frontier you know, society violence, but the underlying motivation seems to be very different. And so we went down there and did a survey experiment, assuming it was a frontier style thing. And all of the results were garbage. Nothing came through like we thought it would. Uh, So we're designing more studies and we're going to probe this and try to understand this phenomenon um, a little more uh, closely. But um, that's the, that's the basic idea is when this vigilantism, what's driving it and, and you know, what, how should we respond to society? Very interesting. Well, David, um, I thank you for stopping by here and doing an interview with us. And uh, like I said before, if, if you're a correctional officer and you haven't picked up this book, The Social World or The Social Order of the Underworld, um, I would do it. And I haven't read your new one. I would like to get you back on here and maybe we'll talk about the new one. But uh, if someone wants us to reach out and talk to you or uh, get a hold of your books, where can they do that? Uh, well, I, my email is david underscore scarbeck at brown dot edu. Uh, I'm occasionally on Twitter at David Scarbeck, and uh, the book's uh, available on Amazon and, and any other fine any fine retailer. So, thank you so much. It's been lovely to be in conversation with you, and uh, really enjoyed talking to you. Absolutely, I enjoyed it too. We'll uh, we'll do this again. If you enjoy these podcasts, the best way to support the Prisoner Officer Podcast is to share these episodes with your friends or or family on social media. Let me invite you to visit www.theprisonofficer.com. If you haven't already, check out the Prison Officer Podcast on Facebook and click that little follow button. Or leave us a message, or better yet, leave us a review. And if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Google, or Spotify, please click the subscribe button. Until next time, I'm Mike Cantrell. Watch your back, and please take care of each other out there behind those walls. 